welcome you all back to this our show, Human Human Architecture on ThinkTech Hawaii. And Us is using that old 1930s movie theme, and then there was a remake in 1955, because I know you, the Soto, are interested in that. And this is the three from the gas station, the drei von der Tankstelle. This is the three bald guys from the gas station. And this is you, the Soto Brown, in your Ossipov design home in Diamond Head. And it's you, Matt Noblet, here with us on the island, not in Boston, where you usually working-wise are, uh, back in your second home in Kailua, Oahu, <laughs> Hawaii. Welcome back, guys. Good to see everybody. All right, and uh, this would be uh, a reason for celebrating because we are, um, uh, this is our 300 uh, human human architecture show. And you just sort of pushed us just over the 16,000 accumulated viewer shows with your shows of the last weeks, which are very popular, rightly so, for being good, but also rightly for a very tragic reason. And if we have the first slide up, which I guess we have, we already see why, because we cannot not talk about the tragic uh, reason uh, that Lahaina just totally got destroyed, uh, the community of Lahaina on Maui, and uh, many people got killed and many got displaced. So this is the background that we will pick up upon. And we had left last time when we were together at the top, uh, we see the two projects that we wanted to basically phase out with Matt uh, about, um, you know, sort of looking at the past and um, into a prospect of the future of our islands with these two homes, one being the uh, the Lily Strand house and the one, the other one being the one you are broadcasting from, Matt, uh, your in-laws <laughs> house there. And, uh, you know, uh, they both wouldn't be anymore if they would have been in Lahaina because they're both stick frame, light frame, wood construction. So today, let's try to sort of, you've been doing remembering Lahaina, um, uh, looking at the past. We call this here, membering Lahaina, looking into the future. And it's it's sort of a touchy try. And uh, we just want to brainstorm and reshovel some of the thoughts we already had in the past and 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 see them some new and have some brainstorming sort of unbiased and unconditional because um you know we there's a lot of okay when should we rebuild will we rebuild do we give enough time for griefing all these questions and how do we rebuild and there were some rumors and one of them got recently confirmed we will share more but uh senator stanley chang always feeds us right before our shows with his newsletter and he has a, um, a quote to an, a TV, local uh, KHON TV coverage about some of the uh, shelters. They're flying in, the military flies them in, and they're pre-made collapsible uh, metal insulated shacks that they make into temporary housing, which is well meant. Uh, but we want to throw out if if it's the right thing, because it's a, it's a re- uh, welcoming to the missionary um, housing of Hermetic, um, the Western standard that might may, we might want to take a chance of revisiting or uh, reconnecting more to sort of neo-indigenous roots. So that being said, let's bring up the first slide. Uh, and this is someone uh, joining us, rejoining us, our exotic escapism expert, Susanna because broadening up the mind to other places in the world. My colleagues are currently having guest speakers in from Tahiti, uh, my academic colleagues, and from post-Katrina, and also from other places. The Soto, let's start out, because this is uh, our sibling uh, island chain. As, as we are the, um, the Polynesian island chain, there is the Macaronesian, and we have covered many of them. And also parallel to us, there is on the island on Tenerife, uh, there is a similar thing going on. And that's uh, quoting at the top left, also from uh, the uh, Star Advertiser. That's on Tenerife, which we have a big similar fire going wild blasting. And the, the picture is, this is a, a selection of what uh, Suzanne has shared with us. And let's just brainstorm on the ideas or your thoughts, your emotions, about what you see, what maybe is different on, and this is the island of the Azores, by the way. The Azores are governed by Portugal, as Madeira is, that we have done a lot of coverages, which are shown at the second from the bottom left. 
but this is the Azores. So what do these images trigger? Similarities and differences and what we can learn from for a, for, for a rebuilding uh, on Maui, guys. Let's just get the brainstorming started. Um, I'm thinking there are various concepts to be, be taken into account here. And of course, first of all, there needs to be <laughs> housing right away to house the people who've been displaced because hundreds of homes were destroyed. The rebuilding process what is that going to entail? And is the zoning going to change, for example, so that uh, buildings are pulled back from the shore so that they are no longer dealing as much with the rise of the ocean levels? That's already been a problem along that coastline. And for economic reasons, the Lahaina was an attraction which earned a great deal of money. Economically, it's very important. Part of its attraction was that it was housed in old, charming looking buildings. And the newer buildings were built to fit in with those older buildings, mostly from the early 20th century. So the commercial district, is it, is it, do they try to replicate buildings? Do they try to create a similar feeling? Um, do they do some dramatic changes to the entire layout of the town? So that for example, Front Street becomes a pedestrian street rather than a vehicular street. All of these things are very long-term questions. And, oh, and the other thing, too, is there are historic buildings in Lahaina, or there were. Some are completely destroyed because they were made of wood, and others survive as gutted walls. Do those get rebuilt, and are they, in fact, even uh, stable enough to rebuild and reuse? So. These, I'm just asking questions. I don't have necessarily answers for these, but these are concerns that come to my mind, particularly, of course, being the historian <laughs> and looking back at what we have lost. Matt, what do you think? Can some of the images we show here sort of trigger some ideas of what to borrow from a fellow uh, volcanic island? Because that's what the the all these islands, uh, the ones that are governed by Spain, which is Gran Canaria and Tenerife and Lanzarote and the like, and the ones uh, by Portugal, which is uh, Madeira and um, uh, and the Azores, and, and this is from the Azores. So something that we see here that maybe we can learn from them. Mm. What do you think? It's a good. I mean, I, I can't help but thinking that this is. You know, I don't. I, I think. You don't want to generalize too much, but it's difficult not to see all of these events as somehow uh, connected to the, the the consequences of exactly the kind of behavior that we've talked about in this program, you know, endlessly, um, the kind of reliance on fossil fuels, the reliance on fossil fuel driven transportation, uh, the need to find more sustainable ways to to, de to develop and to build and and Certainly, you know, <clears throat> it's too early to, 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 I think, probably talk about specifics in Lahaina or any 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 of these places. Um, but I mean, I think you know, Desoto touched on the point. You know, do you think about the sort of the 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 the, the urban situation there differently in the context of uh, you know trying to make it less automobile centric and 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 potentially less energy dense. Um, I think all of these, you know, all of these things are uh, these, the, the sort of the dryness that led to these fires. And even here on Oahu, we were just up at, a, at an orchid farm yesterday here. And the owner was telling us he hasn't seen when he moved here in the in the 80s, on the, the west side of Oahu, it was wet all the time. He said it was just it was constantly wet. And now everything is brown and dry, and you know he hardly has to mow the lawn. It just basically you, it just breaks off. It's so dry, um, and plants that he's importing from the Big Island don't survive here anymore. They turn yellow and uh, and die. All the yeah. signs, all of these things are indicative of, of of a larger global problem that I think we've been arguing people need to pay much more careful attention to. And I think yeah. this is unfortunately, it's very difficult not to imagine that this is a, a product of of that of those yeah. circumstances and, and talking that global i mean this is this is on the other side of the world right but an island chain with similar conditions so for the two points you touched on matt um 
One is at the very bottom left is a show called De Soto from our Volcanic Volume show. We were pointing out, you know, building with uh, what we're made of is lava. And you see the, the in, in the four images there, the top left one, you see that the harbor um, ocean front is actually basically paved with the salt. And and that is um, you know keeping keeping there there is no vegetation there so nothing can burn. Of course, it shows a different in climate because black is basically absorbing the heat. So the Azores have a different climate. It's not quite as hot, so it's not so much of a problem. In fact, in the winters that might actually keep you warm, which happens here too. If some of the boulders that you see on the harbors, if in the winter time you sit on them at uh, at uh, at dusk they they kind of keep you warm right so that's sort of one thing but at the bottom left the show quote this is el hierro which is one of the canarian island ones that we uh, identified as a great raw model along the lines of what you pointed out matt because a, a a politician there of a decades being an engineer that we said shooting ourselves in their feet as architects are often the better architects he has been pushing and pushing through different political leaderships relentless for making this island of El Hierro a sustainable off the grid, decarbonized island, and he has been successful. And so that is a great raw model. And one of the mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the means and methods is what you see in there, which you also see behind Suzanne there on the other island of the Azores, is a hydroelectric power with uh, water basins in the mountains that you use uh, both for powering yourself and as well as a water reservoir for keeping yourself hydrated and wet. Also at the top right is sort of what I learned from you because you had said, while well, I witnessed uh, with uh, having accompanied one of my um, uh, um, uh, non-traditional students who was making a living to study for the too high fees that we charge him, unfortunately, at school, <laughs> he did charter flights for tourists and he had a German on board that he wanted me to translate. And we flew over Maui to pick up with fuel. And I took a picture, which I forgot to put in, but I should at some point, of the last day of the chimney smoking of the last sugarcane the mill there. It's gone now. And you taught me to sort of uh, what kind of an impact that had. Please reiterate that. Well, there have been a variety of changes because of the loss of large-scale agriculture. But the most relevant one for us in discussing Lahaina is the slopes uphill from Lahaina used to all be in cultivation as sugarcane fields. And while sugarcane fields were burned intentionally before harvesting, those burns were all kept under control because people were watching for them. They had equipment to keep the, the fire under control and so forth. When the sugar industry ended, those irrigated fields of green sugarcane went away. And what was left were open land that just grew up with introduced vegetation that's very flammable. So in the winter, it grows and it's green, and in the summer, it dries out and dies, and then it burns. So this is what happened. The, the fire got started, and the winds were so strong that it just was pushed down into populated Lahaina, and it was out of control, and nobody could stop it until it burned everything. Yeah, so what Suzanne gives us, that's food for thought, literally and figuratively speaking, at the bottom right, they on the Azores still have pineapple here there to grow, and we need to get more sustaining ourselves. So maybe we bring back some of that agriculture, not as cash crop, but actually to feed ourselves, right? Yeah. So yeah. that would be an idea, because currently the only cash cr uh, crop that is left is, as you pointed out, the Soto hospitality, right? Mm. And that's a double-sided sword. Getting even more architecturally, but these thoughts were were important because you got to start, as you also pointed out, Matt. Architecture is sort of sort of the end, but you got to start earlier in in a more macro context in 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 agriculture, in land use, in in vegetation, um, or before you get to the built environment. But when you get to the built environment, maybe the natural environment also plays a more integrated role, as we see at the top right from Suzanne, as they have their buildings been greened, right? <laughs> so that helps keeping the buildings cooled uh, because they're shading, you know? And, and where we come from, and you met uh, in parts, I have to return to my other side, my original German, in unfortunately too few days already. And um, 
uh, well, you go to Boston where you lead the, the firm of Banish where that comes from Germany and has its major branches in Germany, right? You could do this in Germany, which is one of your favorite projects, the soda that I showed you from one of the faculty at the Technical the University of Munich, which is student housing, and reiterate that. Well, this was a very clever building, I thought. It was just a, uh, not a very tall one, several stories tall. It was student housing. But the exterior was covered by a, a metal mesh. And on it was growing a vine, which is a deciduous vine that is actually from the United States, but it was being grown in Germany. And it not only, it, it covers the building during the summer with leaves. And so you have shading. And during the winter, it's deciduous, it sheds its leaves. So you have sun in the winter when you want to get warmed up. And it also has the attractiveness of the quality of all of its leaves turning bright red in the fall before they fall off. So it's just a little visual thing that adds to that. But this is just, yes, growing plants is easy to do. And either they cling to the building themselves or they are planted around the building to provide shade. Now, I do have to say that in the case of Lahaina, as well as other fire prone areas, you are advised not to plant directly next to the house because that's more fuel to, to light your house on fire. But Martin, you and I have discussed, and we just have touched on a little bit, the idea that you build back non-flammably and you build back with new technologies that are using things that don't burn in ways that we haven't done yet. And Lahaina is an opportunity for us to explore the use of basalt, which you just mentioned, and the use of stone or aerated concrete that is a product that not only doesn't burn, but it doesn't retain heat. And that's very important in a very hot climate of Lahaina. But again, if we build back so that we can't burn, we're never going to have another disaster exactly like this one. Yeah, and per the point of what they're currently doing with a with a prefab, um, you know, being flown in metal shacks, let's just stay with the material of metal as a as an alternative and revisit one of the recent uh, proposals we have been throwing out, and that gets us to the next slide. Um, and and this is, I mean, it, there's always the question. Yeah, if you ask for People, you know, um, I was watching a, a movie uh, yesterday with one eye and one side of the brain. I think the last face it was called. Um, and um, so, you know, there was the actor was it's a larger different story, but it's about in Africa and, and all the racism and all the war and the civil rights and that stuff. But anyway, so she basically says, you know, displaced people and refugees we look at them as, you know, these kind of stranded people, but they're actually just people like you and I who used to be, uh, you know, what you and I were doing. <clears throat> but I think, you know, if the, the the larger, I mean, it's it's particularly tragic because now all the lives lost and their needs for shelter just adds to the already large need of displaced people, economically uh, displaced people. And here I was consulting a um, an expert who's my banker, Lindy, from my University of Hawaii Credit Union, who we pay too little money, unfortunately. So she um, is, is, is an expert in a tragic way. And she's also my hero because of that, because she's a single mom who lives in social housing. She's a breast cancer survivor. And she had lived, uh, as we call it, transitionally in a car with her daughter for two years. So when they first throughout sort of metal uh, building um, uh, uh, community on Sand Island, as we see at the top right, being sort of, uh, you know, orchestrated in this sort of more sentimental um, wagon wheel radiating out uh, around a, a, a central holly, uh, which is again, well meant, but does not take into consideration uh, how do these feel? Are you getting basically baked in them? because the sun is so hot. I sat down with Lindy as the expert and we were flushing out this here, which gets us to the next slide, which we then developed uh, with uh, multiple generations here, which we call the Cargo Courtyard Cabana, which we revisited in several shows as we see here, 
which is basically uh, using, I avoid saying shipping containers because then people already have a preconceived mind, but cargo steel as a material and cutting them out to the north and uh, lining them up in a row, having their southern facade of the neighboring uh, basically vegetated and also throwing dirt on the roof and, and vegetating it. This is um, uh, using the all-American buy one and get one free system because your neighboring container becomes your uh, your 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 trellis and your and your enclosure of your courtyard. So this is buying you the container is forty by eight, three hundred twenty square feet, which are covered. But since we're in Hawaii, you can open it up and then enclose it with a curtain if you want. So and you get the same three hundred twenty square feet. Outside, you get 640 square feet uh, for whatever the market rate of a ship, shipping container, just like with fish, it changes from a daily day-to-day -day basis based upon the demand. It was $3,000, and that is, a, that is a budget number that we will revisit because Bundet had taken it on as a very low budget for a proposal that he has been doing that we're going to share soon, not this time anymore because we only got six minutes left. But that is a proposal again, and you could you know ship these in uh, easily, fastly. Just cut out the the three fifth on one side, and we believe you get a more tropical, exotic way of living uh, that keeps you cool uh, because it's uh, insulated, but not sort of in a Western way, but in a more sort of a local way. And it gives you a slice of paradise of the sky of Hawaii in your courtyard. It also gives you privacy versus also giving you community, uh, you know, collectiveness when, uh, you know, the, the seating and the ends of the container provide you, you know, provide you that. So it's just throwing out an alternative, basically based on the same material of metal that is basically inflammable. But when, you know, a rage of fire hits it, you know, it's also going to, be uh, not uh, you know uh, secure you, uh, but it's it's we think a tropical exotic way of 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 shelter um, uh, versus a more invasive one. That's at least my thought because I'm biased because um, I created this with a emerging generation. <laughs> well, you know, I wonder if there's. A... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Matt. No, I was just going to say I wonder if there's a way to actually cross ventilate this. Like, does the in the could you have openings on the backside where the green is like high up or something to kind of get, you know, breezes moving through the, through the thing. Absolutely. And we also open the ends of the container. I mean, the one end is naturally open the way the container is constructed. Right. And mm -hmm. we use the doors of the container to enclose the courtyard. Uh, and then you infill, you know, wooden, wooden louvers that you can adjust and the other end, you would basically cut open, so actually get also cross breeze from the sides. And mm -hmm. orientation is key, right? If you place them according to solar, as all the major cities in the world had been uh, before we invented fossil fuel, right? Every city in the world was a Roman, Chinese, whatever, European. The courtyard was the theme, and it was all oriented towards the sun to either embrace the sun in a temperate climate or to protect yourself from the sun in more tropical climates. And this orientation then basically makes the north uh, eastern trade winds basically flush through the opening of the end of the container. So yeah. absolutely rightly so, this is, uh, this is the idea. Let's uh, use the last four minutes to um, um, uh, introduce uh, another potential, and that's the next slide. And this is highly provocative because um, many will think of this being substandard potentially. And, and this is when uh, our uh, client, DeSoto, uh, who is Philip Moiser, who charged us with writing a book that we ne necessarily have to catch up on about mm -hmm. the architecture of Hawaii. And when we drove by this here, which is in Waimanalo, uh, he basically says, well, I'm not telling you what to do, but I would uh, make these uh, pr one of the projects being featured in the book, and we will, right? Because this is how uh, several indigenous people basically don't see another way as to uh, take care of their being, them being sheltered. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's absolutely true. And there, there are various ways to think about this. And one of the things that I've learned from you is to think outside the box in terms of building things. And 
one of the things that you've taught me is the use of cabling and the use of fabric and or some kind of uh, like a fabric substance to create to create buildings. And that's not something I would normally have thought about. This is emergency housing using whatever you can scrounge, but there are ways to use the same sort of concept of cabling up fabric to create buildings, which not only are going to be comfortable and something that people want to live in, but it's also something that I think in some cases you can do a lot quicker and you're not necessarily using as much material to build them. So while this is actually a tragic economic site, if we go from what the concept is, I think there are other things to think about that are potentially useful. Let's throw the next slide in for that. And um, two minutes left. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on, which Bucky Fuller calls tensegrity, by the way, right? So it's not <laughs> using gravity as one of the ideas we, DeSoto, you said, inspired by the Azores, saying using more of the basalt that we have, maybe in a stereotomic way, meaning stone on stone, so to speak. But this is the other end. This is, uh, you know, this is what spiders do to weave, right? <laughs> and, and as you said, use as little. And one of the founders, you know, founding projects of your firm, Matt, is based upon that. That's Günther Benisch's uh, Olympics in Munich in 72, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the, mm -hmm. if not the prime, the best example of tensegrity. So one mm -hmm. minute left, no, thoughts. I, <laughs> I, I, I drive by that encampment every day. Um, whenever we can we always take the right the road to Waimanalo into town and um I, I actually i find it at some level totally appropriate that the the people who inhabit those things have done so have, have actually reclaimed the sort of the best land on the island right after i mean i don't know exactly who was in there and, and so forth but then but the idea that, that um you know people people without the means to house themselves have kind of at least been able to kind of claim the best property on the island right and and to and, and to, so there's certainly something there to, to explore and i think that these kind of lightweight structures that maybe don't trouble people as much because they don't necessarily they, i mean i think there's there, there are bigger questions about security and safety and also infrastructure that that encampments like this uh, bring up right that i think have to be dealt with and solved it's it's never quite as simple as just throwing a tent up and and living a happy life um but i think those are i think these are all things particularly in this climate that you you do have to you can th you have to think about and consider all right we're at the end of the time to sort of you just gave me an idea that i'm going to weave into the next week when we pick up from here this is an exciting and i think you know um kind of an itchy but uh so not easy at all uh but very relevant discussion to have so let's pick up from there next week and until then please stay sophisticatedly safe safely sophisticated bye bye <laughs>